to. All right, it's uh, just after 6.30, so I'd like to get started with our uh, joint school committee meeting on April 9th at 6.30, Dover Sherman Middle School. Um, I believe we have a quorum for all committees represented. What, did it double check? Awesome. Um, before we get started, uh, I would like to wonder if there's any community comments. Hearing none. I will move on to the second agenda item, which is the superintendent evaluation timeline, which our esteemed Ann Hovey is going to give us an update. Did everybody get a packet? No, I didn't. I didn't. Sorry. Did they have a printout up here? And they were out of order. My fault. And out of order. That's right. So you're going to need one for this. So grab one. Um, I have a lot of extra, and I only kept um, printed out 16. So if you did not get no, this um, is one, I think. The yeah, yeah. public, it says the public schools of Dover and Sherman at the top is There's the. This, there was another one. <coughs> from the SESC Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee. Did everybody get one of those in their packets? Yep. Yeah. And then also for this part of the conversation, you need to have the end of cycle summative evaluation report from the superintendent, which is Sorry. stapled to the ones on it. All right, everybody's good? All right. Um, so this is a process we do every year. It's a really important thing that we do. It's one of our key responsibilities um, to provide the evaluation for the superintendent. Um, that say it can be a really daunting experience, especially if it's your first time looking at the rubric that we need to fill. Um, but it's really important for us. To, so that's why I want to go through it right now, even if you've done it before. Um, to hopefully refresh your memory. Um, <coughs> excuse me. First, um, it's really important to note that this process is not tied to Dr. Keo's compensation in any way. Um, so this is purely we're following through on what our requirements, state requirements are. And also, the other objective is that it's designed to be um, informative, um, meaningful, not just paper pushing. Um, let's see. For th those who did this last year, it'll feel a little bit different because we have a strategic plan that provides specific goals and benchmarks. Um, and because we have a strategic plan and it's been used to inform actions, decisions, and even meeting agendas, at least at the region, um, we've had we have better access to information that can be used to complete the form. But having said that, if when you're going through this, this is what to be filling out. If we go through and if one of the questions, you're like family and community engagement, I have no idea if Dr. Keo does, you know, addresses family and community concerns in an equitable manner, because I've never seen him do it. Um, it's okay if you leave something blank. The only ones that you have to fill out are step one, two, and three. So the first two pages. Um, actually, the first page in a little bit. Um, and it's okay to leave something blank. Um, and it's also that's really important for people to really remember that an individual's evaluation could become part of the public record. Um, and I will say there's a, something that's a little bit more informal a little bit later about that. All right, looking at the rubric. So the ratings, if you look at the beginning, are. Um, for step one is did not meet some progress, significant progress, met and exceeded. For step one, you actually need to, as it says there, you have to go and finish um, page four first and then go back to step one, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you actually do one, two, and three last. Skip those and skip five, actually, and just start with. Um, the Superintendent Mid-Cycle Performance Schools Progress Report, which is page three. Mm -hmm. So you do page three, four, or actually no, three. Um, we will have, um, that's what you're providing. <clears throat> yes, I will provide, um, the, I'll actually self-evaluate myself on the whole thing, mm -hmm. and then I'll send that out um, tomorrow, mm -hmm. if that works. Yep. It's already done. So I'll just, Put in a quick email, but yes. To go to the email that I've already sent Cheryl. Uh, okay. I'll hold that. I'll hold it's, it's attached. Okay. Tomorrow you'll get an email that will have this that's in a, um, a fillable PDF 
you'll get a copy of this memo, which we'll actually go through a little bit more carefully tonight, because um, as the dates on it as a reminder, we'll have Andrew's goals, his mid-cycle evalu self-evaluation, his end-of-cycle self-evaluation, and links to two pages that um, Jesse pages that explain um, <laughs> the process and what each of these goals and what, what all the parts of this mean. So that should be helpful um, tomorrow. So you'll get that tomorrow. Cheryl already has it, but we want to send it out after this meeting. Um, all right, so going back to this. So, so you're filling out four or five, the, myth, the superintendent's performance goals and the performance ratings for instructional leadership, management operations, community and family engagement, and professional culture. Then you go back right. and do one, two, one and two, which then inform three. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's nice. Okay. We are not doing four, the rate impact on student learning. Um, we don't have to, and since we're a high-performing district, we, it doesn't. We're okay, but it doesn't add value for us. Then step five is the evaluator comment. That is where you provide more commentary on the things that you see as areas of um, success, areas for improvement. The idea is this is about continual growth. Um, and helping to improve the district. And so that's sort of where most of the comments are, are going. But this can, you can write anything you want Andrew to read. This can be what you end up reading into public comment. On April 30th, we will read, you have the opportunity to read um, about a, a minute to two minutes into um, a statement into the public record. That then becomes part of Andrew's file. If you don't read something into the public record, it does not become official. It does not become part of this file. Um, you don't have to read something. Last year, not everybody did, and that's fine. Um, it can be short. You don't have to do it for one or two minutes. You can say you know, three sentences if that is what feels right for you. <coughs> and But once again, anything that you write here whether you say it at the public meeting or not, does become part of public documents if someone requests to see them. I think, however, you are required to write, a, like you say it's optional to do the commentary, but no, if no, you have- So I'm optional to read it out loud. No, but it has to be on the record if you have given an overall summative rating of either exemplary or needs improvement or unsatisfactory. It's right there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So if as an evaluator in the that's step true. three overall, you are giving either unsatisfactory or needs improvement or exemplary, you must provide uh, um, comments and analysis to defend that rating. And then that but that is required to. No, be. You, you don't have to say it. Out but loud. then it's not in the record. Correct. 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 Just because because your okay. your overall is being rolled up into 16 anyway. Okay. So it may or may not be reflective in the overall groups gotcha. in the end. Okay. And where do the if those comments are not read into the record, mm -hmm. do those still get communicated to Dr. Kia? Yeah. Or no? Has the option. Yep. Looking at them or not looking at them. It's up to him. And then after everything has been handed in, we'll go over the timeline in a minute. After everything's been handed in, the SESC, which is Henry, Kate, Lori, myself, we will compile um, both the comments and then the, the ratings. Um, and we develop whatever seems to be the best. We could use the same process we used last year or something different. We are not allowed to discuss it, debate it. It's purely collating. Um, we can't edit comments. We don't have, and if we see trends, it's more like we talk about trends to create a, a cumulative summary um, that then becomes, also then becomes part of the permanent record that will be read out loud 
will be shared with the committee, shared with Andrew, shared with the committee, and then shared in public session. So there is an opportunity for people to comment on that and make changes if they feel that's necessary or appropriate. Um, and then it will become part of the permanent record. So Andy, the, the collating that happens, um, you said you, you, you roll up the, the comments. <coughs> So our comments uh, lifted some verbatim or partly verbatim into the collating or, or not? Because if they are, then they'll just there'll be repetition. Generally, of... no, it's more like trends. If we Good. see the five people comment on X, um, if it seems that this area was a particular strength or this was a particular weakness, then we'd comment on It's more of okay. like that as opposed to direct quotes. Although if there's something that crystallizes exactly what we're thinking, or what it seems like everybody's thinking, we could certainly use that. And then just. And if you want that to be part of the record, you read it out loud. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And just to perhaps ask Michael's question in a different way. I, I, I'd love to know what Andrew will be seeing. Will, will, will he be seeing the, the collation and, and, the, and the, the summary document um, and all the comments or, or will he, uh, it'd, be, it'd be nice to know what what you'll look at, I think. Um, it, it would just help me in terms of choosing what to say. Well, he has access to... I know he has access to oh. I have access to lots of things, but I don't go there. No, I could, you know, I mean, just go in and take a look. I mean, think last year you will is my question. Absolutely. Okay. But I and I also think that um, last year people submitted things that came to me mm -hmm. after the process was through. I I think it was the stated comments where I was given the stated comments. Well, the stated comments were what's read. Yes, that's in the, in the minutes. So what yes. we submitted last year, what we didn't actually collate any comments. We didn't opine at all. It was it was. I can read it to you. It was, it was the the three the three school committees completed individual evaluations. This was the overall rating. The minutes reflect the comments. No, the, no we did write a summary though. Cause no, I found, no, no, this is what no. went to What's the state. This, I found. This is what went to the state. Oh, went to the state. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Because all right, I'll talk to you later. Okay. I found I found in my email in my notes something that was a, a, an overall summary mm -mm. this is what I, I this okay. is what we submitted to the state okay it was it basically because we didn't want to put any of our the four of our opinions it's in, yeah into the evaluation we wanted to only reference the minutes if someone wanted to go to our minutes and read everybody's comments they'd be welcome to do that okay it has to do with the legal process and having gone through conversations with John Stein about based on the evaluation law what we really think to And it's trickier because we're the three. Trickier what? Because, because we're three, we're three committees. And we um, hire a superintendent through a union committee. OK. Yeah, and certainly anything will be run through. Joan, if we have any questions, for sure. Um, so just. Could we can quickly just go through if we can look at the memo. And, and oh, are there any other yeah. copies of that memo? Uh, yes. Yeah. I have lots of them. People need yeah. multiple. Do yeah. yeah. you need a tip? Please, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we'll go. Yeah. <laughs> you need a tip? No, oh, no, it's no, my no. fault. He co-laid oh. it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what happened. Speaking yeah, of co-laying. No <laughs> Selective <laughs> collation. I got it. Thank you. Where I had them. Good thing I'm not on. Oh, do you have one? No, I didn't. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out where. Anybody else need one? Everybody's good. All right, so we're discussing clearly tonight. Tomorrow we'll get an email. Um, obviously, there's going to be a lot more in that is in that email, but those are certainly two of the documents that you'll get. Um, Tuesday, April 23rd. So it's a relatively quick turnaround. Completion of steps one through five and comments that you plan to read on the record. It's optional, so once again, you do not need to read comments on the record. Also, if you can't be at that meeting on 4.30, you can give your comments to someone else to read for you. Um, then, I believe it's gonna be Wednesday, we'll meet, the SESC will meet. Um, that's pretty straightforward. 
and then Tuesday, April 30th from 6 to 7, because we have a, another meeting after that. Similar to this one, we'll just swap. No, actually, we'll do the same thing. We'll do the superintendent evaluation, and then we'll do start time. Um, so that's 6 to 7 on April 30th. Um, I think it's fairly straightforward. Otherwise, please remember that there are people who have done this before. So if you haven't and you have questions, and your chairs are well versed, so please feel free to reach out and ask questions. It feels daunting if you look at it. I remember my first time, like, I have no idea. But when you really dig into it, and especially if you dig into it with Andrew's um, goals and mid year evaluation and then end of cycle self evaluation, it's I, he's done a good job of what goes into which categories. So I think it should be pretty straightforward. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you guys for doing that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, the next item on the agenda is our uh, school start time presentation that Dr. Kia will do in terms of presenting uh, some of the work that has been done by your committee. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you once again for everyone that's been on it. I know there's been a lot of work in terms of conversations and surveys, talking to outside groups that are influential within the community, um, obviously students, administration, faculty, the parents and the like. So um, I believe then you'll also be presenting a couple scenarios for us to review. Um, the idea is, and you've had some of this work or um, items in front of you to take a look at, if there's questions that you have based on the scenarios that are presented, um, I would suggest we make those known and then you can bring those back to the committee if there's more work that needs to be done in terms of further clarification. Um, maybe there's something that we bring up that maybe for some reason hadn't been thought of, um, which would help you and your committee sort of think about what the next steps would be if there is a final recommendation for us to review at a later date. Mm -hmm. um, so without any further ado, Dr. Keogh. Okay, very good. So um, if it's okay with the committees, I, I would prefer to stay up here yeah. and just yeah. basically the work. The the, there's uh, right here, Henry. Is that okay? Yeah. Are you able to, are you guys able to see? There's or one you more you might want to. I don't know if it does with the camera. That's, can you see or good. do you need that's some more? Is that, is that okay? I can actually slide back too. Whatever works. Um, okay, so um, yeah, what I'd like to do, if if possible, is just kind of start out with uh, kind of an overview of of you know why we did this and and where we are, and um, so really the the background is this that we were we reviewed the work of the previous DS Start Time Committee. Uh, we did uh, comprehensive science and studies research. We studied systems that made changes. Uh, we looked at the what, the hows, the whys um, locally in, uh, in the U.S. and abroad, uh, <clears throat> which included really a detailed kind of peer review of systems that have made start time changes, as well as um, looked at superintendent or did a superintendent survey. Um, and in this process, uh, put the questions point blank to the Start Times Task Force. Uh, do we ultimately believe that all of this warrants some kind of change? And the unanimous um, feeling of the Start Times Task Force was, yes, something should be done. We did not, um, as a task force, um, vote on scenarios. Um, we spent a lot of time, as mentioned by Henry, um, really trying to educate people and communicate what we were learning along the way. We felt like it was really important that if we were going to survey people at any time, that they would be better prepared to do that if they knew the facts. So uh, we made a, a special effort on that, um, went out to at least 21, more than that, uh, stakeholder meetings, Met with faculty, students, had expert speakers, created the web page, um, uh, a lot of one-to-ones and email for feedback, uh, and even my TV show. So that's saying something. That's that's when you know it's really important. 
Um, we did develop some possible scenarios for DS, which I will get to. Um, and uh, uh, we surveyed the students, the staff, and the families. So we wanted to make sure that we kind of went through a, a thoughtful process on this. <clears throat> so some of the things that jumped out at us on the, start, on the science, and I don't really want to take a deep dive into this, but one thing that really stood out was that scientifically, the circadian rhythm of adolescence is actually very different from all others. So their sleep and wake times shift two hours later, so to 11 a.m. than all other age groups. And there's no way to kind of behaviorally manipulate that. It's just when their bodies kick in. They get tired at 11 o'clock, typically, for, for adolescents. Um, it came up in the conversations, well, what about the younger kids? Well, younger kids typically, according to their clocks, get tired earlier and therefore wake up earlier. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics and so many, many others in the medical profession and public health uh, uh, professions recommend a minimum of eight to 10 hours of sleep for teenagers and urge that secondary schools not begin before 8.30. DS students reported not getting enough sleep. Um, I think we've known this for a while. The most recent data was from the Challenge Success Survey in which the kids reported to us averaging 6.75 hours per, per night of sleep. Uh, this was really, this is something that really jumped out at me from the Dr. Seisler event, and that was that sleep is when the brain is rejuvenating. So um, the deepest adolescent sleep in their cycle is around 4.30 to 6.30, and that's when the brain is processing the day's information, the prior day's information and kind of storing it into the long-term memory. So as Dr. Seisler said, if you are cramming for exams, you're really not, you're not meshing with uh, all the benefits of good sleep. You're better off getting a good night's sleep. So um, that's really important information. Um, and obviously, I know we've said this before, but lack of sleep is highly correlated with emotional um, issues, physical issues, um, um, anxiety, depression, decreased self-esteem, inattention, increased stress. That didn't really surprise me, because when you think about it, those of us who have lacked sleep before, I mean, this is how it shows itself. Um, but there's actually research to show that fatal car accidents uh, involving teens um, can be tracked back to lack of sleep, athletic injuries, obesity. So they're all um, important factors. Uh, when we looked at other schools, we saw that uh, schools across the country have made changes, um, some with who can actually prove the positive effect uh, in sleep and outcomes. The Seattle study, uh, study was actually the most widely reported, and um, that's on our webpage, I know. There are schools within the Tri-Valley League that have made changes to their tar uh, start times recently, and others are definitely studying. Um, we confirmed that over 35% of mass secondary schools are either studying or have made change versus 25% have not, period, and 40% aren't sure. Uh, the entire Middlesex League, uh, actually, uh, which is Burlington, uh, Wilmington, Woburn, uh, a group of towns in that area, Actually, the superintendents joined uh, forces and actually put a statement together saying um, that we're going to we're going to move our start times to 8:30. So they made a decision as a league in order to address some of the athletic issues. Um, and one thing that we found that was very interesting is that of Boston Magazine's top 10, and I know how we feel about the rankings; it gets overplayed quite a bit. But it is important to know how our peers are um, how our peers are operating, and um, and of the top ten from Boston uh, Magazine's um, most recent ranking, at least uh, actually six have made changes and four are considering changes. So the survey um, the survey participation we felt really good about. Um, I'm not sure if it's just because people are very interested or because we prepped them that these were coming, 
but we felt like we had uh, very good um, participation. So the you'll see that the uh, the for the families 670 we're we're adding it up as or using the the uh, factors of 670 participants or 670 surveys were submitted on the family survey, and we're using 733 as the number of families we mail to. So when we mail something out to the entire district, it goes to 733 different recipients. In some cases, that's one family. So when my children was, were here, it was one family, one email address, but many families want two. Um, and so there's no way to know exactly whether or not one family had more than one submission. Um, so if everything was um, exact, then there were 733 families and 670 participants. That would make 91% participation. Uh, the rule of thumb that we used when I was in um, graduate school was that if you have a 33% sampling, that's a considered a valid sample. So you can see our, our numbers were pretty good in terms of participation. Staff was 230 out of 300, or 74%. Middle school and high school, 938 out of 1,203, and 78%. So, um, so in terms of tiredness at school, 77% of the students reported um, that they were tired at least one to five days a week. 18% um, never, and 3% weren't sure, and, the, and there's always other. <laughs> uh, in terms of nightly homework, I don't think these numbers are too shocking for us, um, but they're certainly saying um, our kids are doing a lot of homework. There's no doubt about that. Uh, with 33% in the uh, two to three hours, 14% um, in the three to four, 10% in more than, uh, or yes, more than four. So, um, and then a large number in the zero to two. So uh, this is an interesting way of looking at this. But we asked the students, well, what do you think are the potential benefits to later start and end times? And they said, would get more sleep. <laughs> so um, that was a shocker. Um, but uh, so they are able to identify, obviously, that get some more sleep. Uh, would feel, but I thought it was interesting that they, that they uh, in the second uh, most uh, answered selection, would feel more engaged or focused, physical improvement. So this was very interesting um, information. And they drink less caffeine. Well, they're, they're not promising us that. <laughs> um, in terms of potential drawbacks for the high school and middle school students to a later start and end, um, not surprising, 56% uh, of the kids reported that it would be harder to participate in after-school activities. And I apologize, some of these got cut off. In sports and activities. Sports and activities, thank you. Harder to complete homework. So that is a concern on the minds of students. Harder to participate in after school. Outside. No, uh, yeah, right. One is out of school and one is, and that's out of school. Correct? Yeah. Am I right about that? That makes sense. It was based on questions. Right. So an example of out of school would be a job? Club sports. Club sports versus your ballet class. It could be a job. It could be CCD. It could be could be anything. Um, so um, we did get some comments about this question about the AAP um, recommendation of an 8:30 uh, or later start. We we asked it in such a way so as to um, not necessarily say in absolute alignment with an 830 recommendation from the AAP, but rather in closer alignment. And so you can see the students um, came in at 50% 50, uh, 50 uh, yes, they would support it, uh, 39, almost 40% no, and 9.73 other. 
Um, staff surveys, as I mentioned, there were 233 participants out of roughly 300. Um, so 72%, this was interesting, in terms of relying on child care, and both before and after were consolidated into this uh, particular chart. But 72% um, that said that they do not rely on it. 16% uh, said that they do rely on it, and, and they rely on either daycare or kind of a school-based daycare. And then 7% uh, said that they rely on a relative or babysitter. The reason that was interesting is because we frequently hear how many kids uh, or families rely on their own children to provide after-school care, but this didn't um, this didn't bear out for the faculty anyhow. Um, so we asked, so what about what if we moved times a half hour later? Um, what would the impact be on child care? Again, we're looking at uh, staff. 62% uh, said they would not need to add or modify. 23% said they would need to add or modify. 9% uh, uh, were unsure and 6% in the category of other. Uh, in terms of flipping start times, so in other words, flipping elementary and secondary start times in some form or another, we, didn't, uh, we did actually get into some specifics there. Um, Sixty-three percent said they would not need to add or modify. Twenty-six percent said they would need to add or modify. Six percent unsure. Uh, would later dismissals impact the teacher's uh, ability to uh, provide after-school supervision or serve in a supervisory role after school? Twenty-eight uh, percent uh, said it would be much more challenging for them. 20% uh, said somewhat more challenging, 20% uh, easier to no li or little or no difference, 12% uh, said it'd be impossible, uh, and 16% were unsure. In terms of the uh, closer alignment with the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation of 830 or later, um, 69% that said that they would support a time that was in closer alignment. This was an interesting piece of data. Um, we actually looked at where our staff members live and, um, and calculated where those schools are in the process in terms of either not changing, changing, considering change, and um, what we found was for our, our staff members, 13% lived in communities that had already changed start times, 47% lived in communities that were considering change, 29% lived in communities that were not considering change, and 9% um, and was unknown. So the family surveys, um, do your children get appropriate amounts of sleep? It's really um, pretty close to split. Among our others, most were um, sometimes, which is a pretty good answer. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, families relying on child care. So 80% said they do not rely on uh, before or after school uh, child care. 14% rely on a relative or babysitter, and 6% rely on daycare or school-based school care. Uh, parent support of closer alignment with the AAP recommendation of 830 or later start was roughly 82 percent uh, in favor of some kind of alignment closer to that, and uh, 12 percent opposed. So just quickly, some of the comments. Um, the, ben the benefits of a later or at least 8.30 a.m. start time for middle school, high school are overwhelming. No other arguments should be undermine, uh, should undermine this. The health and well-being of our children is of paramount importance. Science is clear. Um, in terms of cons, um, 
I don't believe that start times will affect the high schoolers' sleep time. They'll just stay up later because they'll be getting up later in the morning. The lack of sleep is due to students being overscheduled because their parents are obsessed with getting them into the right college. Yeah. Not, not too many surprises. <laughs> um, staff comments. Um, this was interesting. I fully st support starting school at 8.30 or later. Um, You know, this this particular staff member was commenting essentially on noticing that kids are tired the first, per first period, period of the day. Um, and I thought this was interesting. I see resistance from my colleagues because it's inconvenient. We should remember that we are here for them, not the other way around. So a as you can imagine, there are fe strong feelings on both sides of this issue kind of throughout the system. Uh, I think it's a very, in the con from a staff member, I think it's a very simplistic view that start times will improve test scores, tardiness, homework completion, et cetera, and decrease disciplinary issues, risky impulse behavior, et cetera. Because there are many factors, home life, testing demands, et cetera, that contribute to these scenarios that would also have to be addressed. <coughs> Let me sleep later and I'll do better is an unrealistic point of view. Um, from the students. Other than the short-term obstacles of rearranging schedules and start times for all the other school-related activities, the long-term benefits of a later start time will help future students for years to come. I had to say, when I read this, I was like, is this from a student? Uh, short-term adjustments seem like an apt trade-off for an increase of academic achievement and mental and physical health for thousands of future Dover Sherman students. Uh, on the downside, I don't like this idea. Along with many other people, students would get less sleep from staying up later. We'd have less time to complete our homework. For students who do after school activities like sports and drama, everything would get pushed back, decreasing their amount of sleep and homework and free time. So the scenarios that, that we came up with that we think could uh, work for Dover Sherburn. The first one is uh, we've referred to as a shift. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm going to apologize first because I was supposed to pass these along to you, but that means you were paying attention, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. OK. So um, I'll give you a second to get these. We are on slide 31. Are those numbered? Um, well, the pages are. The slides okay. are. So it's two on the Cooper page. OK. It's page 16. 16. Okay. Page 16. So what we've referred to as the shift, kind of the key, the key elements of the shift would be moving middle and high school start times later by a half an hour. So the current start time of 7.40 a.m. would move to a later time of 8.10 a.m. And the existing dismissal would move from 2.15 to a new dismissal time of 2.45. Um, another, obviously, at the elementary level, moving Pine Hill School and Chickering Schools start times later by 20 minutes from current start time to, of 8.35 to a new start time of 8.55. Um, the existing end of school day would move from 3 p.m. dismissal to a new dismissal time of 3.20. I would just caution that we are still looking at the bus routes, looking really carefully at the bus routes, because we do hear from people that there are times when the buses are lined up ready to drop kids. There are times we see buses on the side of the road. We, we are kind of in the process of looking at that with Connolly to find out if there are um, other minutes we could capture, especially on the front end in terms of the pickup in the morning. Because if we could find time on the front end, that could make a difference in terms of what times the kids have to get up. Yeah. So um, under the shift, some of the opportunities, more sleep for our teenagers, obviously. A half hour a day, cumulatively two and a half hours a week. Um, obviously, the positive impact on safety, physical and emotional health, uh, improved academic performance. Uh, opportunities. There are there could be opportunities for teachers to meet in the mornings that they haven't uh, necessarily had the opportunity to do in the past. Uh, on the challenging side, or things we noted as challenges, it really doesn't um, strictly meet the APA and other guidelines. 
there are could be concerns about the elementary students later day. Uh, obviously, impact on athletics, extracurricular activities, and after school help. Uh, impact on transportation. Impact on teacher family schedules and childcare, and uh, impact on our Boston students. So the, that was scenario A. Scenario B is a flip, and I'll show you this in a visual. Um, so with a flip, we'd be proposing to move middle and high school start times later by 50, uh, 55 minutes from a current start time of 7.40 to a new start time of 8.35. Existing dismissal would move from 2.15 to a new dismissal time of 3.10. Uh, moving Pine Hill School and Chickering School start times earlier by 45 minutes from the current start time of 8.35 to a new start time of 7.50. Uh, existing end of school day would move from 3 p.m. Uh, from a 3 p.m. dismissal to a new dismissal time of 2.15 for the elementary students. Uh, opportunities, even more sleep. So uh, at the middle and high school level, potentially 55 minutes per day, four hours, 35 minutes per week, which does in fact meet the APA guidelines. Um, and those other um, areas that we talk about, improved academics, uh, health, safety, physical, emotional well-being, we believe would improve. Um, and also again, those opportunities for before school um, activities, especially for staff, um, particularly for staff. On the challenging side, a greater impact on athletics because the day uh, athletic activities would have to begin even later. Uh, extracurricular activities could certainly be impact uh, after school help, impact on transportation, impact on uh, teacher family schedules and child care, impact on our Boston students. Um, people have asked us, well, why can't we just buy a bigger fleet of buses and send everyone at the same time. So we actually looked at that a little bit. Um, we're considering that the one run um, scenario. So all students would start at the same time. Again, this could be adjusted 830, uh, 837, but we would have to crunch every single one of those numbers with Connolly and be absolutely certain before we could say, um, exactly the time but we're for the sake of this um, presentation we're saying an 8 35 a.m start for both um, middle school and high school and middle school and elementary with the high school and middle school students ending a little later than the elementary students and um, there's nothing uh, really here in terms of opportunities that's any different than the opportunities that come from the flip, uh, we know that um, that this could have a major impact on our transportation needs. Uh, you essentially would have to double your bus fleet. And um, that would roughly cost us a million dollars to do. Um, so there is a significant cost factor there. So. I try to put these on a, a chart so that you can see them uh, a little differently. And I'm not sure that it's um, especially easy, but and I'm, I'm not going to go through the times again because I just read them. But um, but I can certainly go back to these if people have questions. So those are the three scenarios uh, for middle and high school. But just in terms of start times alone, the shift would be a new start time of 8.10 as opposed to 7.40. A flip would be a new start time of 8.35 as opposed to 7.40. And the one run would be a, a 8.35 a.m. start. This is for the secondary schools at the elementary level with a shift. The new start time would be 8.55 as opposed to 8.35 the um, the flip would be, mean a um, uh, new start time for the elementaries of 750 so they'd be coming uh, quite a bit earlier uh, as opposed to their 835 currently 
and um, the times wouldn't really change uh, for the elementaries on a one run. So we did take a moment to just look at this in a different way. And um, actually, uh, Michael Jaffe has been invaluable in terms of looking at the data and kind of crunching all of this and worked with Amanda. Was it Amanda Brown on this particular slide? Or was it you, Michael? Mostly you. Mostly Michael. <laughs> so do you mind, Michael, explaining kind of? No, or I'll give a more of a short sound bite. Okay. Um, so essentially, I guess the, the, the takeaway is regardless of what as a school system we did with start times, whether it was a flip or a shift or, or even a, a, a flip and a shift, um, it's impossible for us to give our adolescents, all of our adolescents, the opportunity to get enough sleep each night. Sorry about that. Um, uh, if you, so, so the, the facts are average 11 o'clock sleep time for adolescents. That's their biological clock. Um, and also that the average adolescent needs between eight and 10 hours of sleep. So if you simply just take your 11 o'clock sleep, add to that eight hours, you're at a seven o'clock wake up. You add to that nine hours, you're at an eight o'clock wake up. You add to that 10 hours, you're at a nine o'clock wake up. And that's assuming that kids are waking up in class, right? You still need to account for the time for them to get from home to the classroom. So unless we had start times at 10 o'clock, you couldn't accommodate every one of the kids within that average. So what we're doing by moving the time later, and if you see the red there, the average deficiency is two and a half hours. Um, we're just increasing the pool of kids who are able to get, to have the opportunity to get enough sleep each night. We can't guarantee, unless we push them way out, that all the adolescents or all the, the uh, middle school, high school students would have that opportunity. And then it's just visually depicted in the middle there what those three times would, would yield. Can I just ask the 9.25? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that come from? The, and averaging the, the bottom. It's now it's it's really the the and that's that's a great question. The 9.25 is really more the the plurality of if if you were to pinpoint a particular time with the plurality of the medical associations, they would say 9.25 is it. But generally, okay. it's between eight and ten. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Michael. So um, there's a lot here. Um, I put together a timeline just to kind of refresh where we uh, said we were going to go with this. Um, obviously, the presentation of findings and scenarios tonight and hearing your feedback in response to this and hearing um, any concerns or things that you'd like us to look into further, and perhaps we can answer the questions here tonight. Um, then from tonight until um, the 30th, you know, a continued solicit solicitation of feedback on these scenarios. On the 30th, uh, I would um, like to come forward with a recommendation. And um, obviously that would need um, uh, an affirmative vote of the joint school committees. And, um, but I um, have already suggested that if we were going to make a change, it wouldn't and couldn't or shouldn't go into effect until uh, the 2020-21 school year. So um, I have to uh, take a minute just to thank the many, many people who participated in this, because this was a lot of work. Michael Jaffe was, uh, was a super co-chair. He has done a tremendous amount of, of research and really reaching out to people and um, you know, if there's one thing that uh, matters a lot to me in this process is I don't like to make decisions unless I know the facts. I like the facts straight, um, and I feel much better informed on this topic than ever before in my life. And I know Michael has said the same thing to me. We've we've learned a lot through this process, and and the entire um, Start Times Task Force, I'm sure, would say the same thing. Um, 
I do want to thank the representatives who are on the joint school committees, um, Judy and Michael and Amanda Brown. Thank you so much. Um, Don Fattori, who's here. Uh, thank you. John Smith, our headmaster from the high school, has been a participant all the way through. Uh, thank you, John. Laura Dayal. Um, Hannah Wright. I don't believe uh, these guys are here. Hannah Wright, who's a high school teacher. Laney Glenn, middle school teacher. Jen Ryan and Nicole Dara kind of swapped uh, elementary teachers. And Kevin Scannell, who is here tonight. Skevin, uh, Kevin was a huge help to us. Uh, so thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, he's, uh, he's very talented when it comes to surveys, <laughs> we learned. So, uh, so I want to thank all of them and, um, and really just take your questions. I have a question. Uh, I'm wondering where the bus time data came from, because my personal experience with our bus doesn't fit in with the, <laughs> with the times that are here. It doesn't. OK. Um, um, Okay, so they're they're definitely off from the true bus time in my experience. So I think we'd have to actually go on the bus routes or follow bus routes and get actual information about and when earlier. My bus um, for my boys picks them up um, for Pine Hill around like eight twelve, and right here it says that it goes till seven fifty seven. That would be the first. That would be the first pickup. The starting route, the starting first bus pickup on each of the buses. That's what the start. When is the last? Before school starts. Right. Then okay. that's I mean, not when we're. Okay. We, I thought and, you and, meant the buses ran from 7:35 to 7. No, we. Yeah. What we did is we keyed off of the the first bus pickup okay. for each one of the routes. It looks like that. That is. That's the range of okay. buses. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. Thank Firstly, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Um, so I had three questions in my, in my mind. The first one was of the schools that have made the change. Um, and I suppose part of me is thinking in Massachusetts, but possibly is there any data across the country? How many have embraced a flip or a shift or, or you know? Uh, in the unlikely situation or a, a one run. Um, and uh, I'm not looking for exact numbers, but is, is there any sense of proportions or, or what's what's been chosen? You have that. Yeah, I actually, I can distribute a slide on that, but I, so we do have that Massachusetts information. Right. Um, what's actually quite interesting is that so the, the EPA guidelines of the no earlier than 8.30 came out. It was late 2014. Um, so that kind of disseminated and, and, and then other organizations kind of signed on to that. Um, there was a definite trend line where most of the changes in Massachusetts were more akin to that 20 to 30 minute shifts um, prior to 2015, even halfway into 2016. When you look at 2016, 17, and 18, they're progressively getting later and later and later. So the 2017 to 18 changes in Massachusetts, the average time is around 824. 824? <coughs> yeah, so most of them have been flips. Um, two schools that are notable that did shifted uh, shifts, one is uh, Concord Carlisle, uh, the other is Acton Boxborough. Those were both fairly recent. Um, particular uh, idiosyncratic issues that they had, one with, actually they were both with busing uh, mm -hmm. and, and having to deal with, they, 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 if they had their druthers, they would have made them later, but financially they couldn't make them work out or resource-wise with bus resources. Uh, so those were shorter. One thing that was interesting anecdotally was that um, W that uh, that actually a superintendent sent something out just last week, polling other superintendents about where you are in this process and kind of put a live spreadsheet up. So people were plugging in their information. It's fascinating to me to see actually how many are, are now looking at it. And I would argue that since the time that uh, DS looked at it last, it has um, really started to um, pick up momentum. There's been discussion at the legislative level uh, about kind of mandating it. I think that they're going to stop short of that. Um, but you never know. Yeah, the, in Massachusetts, the, the legislation is really to have a state level study 
of the issue. Um, California actually passed legislation uh, for no earlier than 830. It was vetoed by Governor Brown. Uh, it's coming back before the legislature um, with a different governor. Um, so just two more quick things. And uh, one is on on the, on the challenges of the one run, the financial challenges of the one run. Was there any um, work done or, or any sense of how other communities who chose that solved creatively the, the financial challenge? Were, were there um, changes in decisions on asking families who live a certain distance away from the school to pay? Um, I'm, I'm just in one order, or, or did there, 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 not, there aren't many down. one runs. Yeah. Um, that isn't to say what, what's kind of interesting is is, is many. Um, I I couldn't say the majority, but many school districts have spent a lot of money hmm. to to make any change. So there are things like going from a four run to a three run, or a three run to a two run, um, and and spending some bucks to do that. Uh, many schools also charge for their busing. Um, and so they saw that as opportunity. We can get, we can actually increase ridership, right. and and bring in some more revenue to pay for for some more of the buses. Uh, didn't see a whole lot of the the one run. Okay. And, go on, Andrew. No, no, go ahead. And I, I just, I'd love to maybe ask Kevin just to, um, <laughs> sorry, mate. I, 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 I just having a student on that committee, I think was fantastic. And I know we had the student survey data that the superintendent spoke about but if there's anything you can say that would let us into the minds of your peers and, and, and whether it's worries or optimism or I'd, I'd love to hear it the student body is pretty split on the issue um, half of my friends are in support and half, half are not um, the biggest concern is about athletics and after school like activities but other than that People are pretty in support of it. Kevin, by the way, did um, a really nice uh, video which we showed to our ninth and tenth grade students um, as kind of a, a way to present this information to them. I, I um, Kevin put the video together and then I spoke with the kids. And there was no doubt um, in, in, uh, that there's anxiety, but interest, um, and definitely concern about homework. But um, that seems to be kind of the, the the rally cry of everyone who has an issue with school. It's all about the homework. Um, but uh, they were definitely telling us in their feedback to me that um, that homework is a concern for them. Oh, I was just gonna, um, to to Kevin's point about activities, after school activities, at help and athletics. Given that those have always been critical parts of our high school experience for our students. How have you guys thought through, John, I don't know if John or, or you can talk to what thinking is around how those, how either of those scenarios would play out in terms of after school help and athletics slash so, activities. So I'll let John uh, speak to uh, the after school help um, because we did, we have actually talked about that quite a bit and um, and Ron Sudmeyer, our um, inter interim athletic director, went on a, a kind of a search for information um, on on that. But what would you say, John? And so, can I, can I, sorry, add one more because those were on my list too. Can you also add if you guys have talked about advisory, the morning session, and um, missing first period if you don't have a class. As other things. Okay, yeah. That's all related to John. So, yeah. <laughs> um, in line with the after school uh, participation, you know, as many of you know, and certainly the regional school committee knows, about 80% of our students participate in interscholastic athletics. It's huge. And it's a big part of our culture. It's a really important part of our culture. In addition, 65 clubs. Uh, so, you've got all of those groups meeting and after school um, help. So contractually, the after-school help would still be in place. It just would be pushed off. So right now, our teachers uh, contractually must stay after. Some will be before. Some will be after school. And then obviously, with a later start, 
that may have to change, right? Because why are we looking at a later start, yet we might still be having early morning session, might defeat the perks. So we've, we've looked at that and adjusted. One of the ways where we may be able to gain some time back for families, because I'm also pretty adamant about days in which we don't have athletic contests, I want the kids off the field by 5.30 with their families, and then I feel as though, then it's families making decisions as to the next step. If, if your child's gonna continue doing some other activity, that's a family decision. Um, so right now, school gets out at 2.15, and practices get started at three o'clock. In talking to students, the majority of students in a normal extra health session don't normally stay that full time slot. They may pop in for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but they then also want time to go change, get something to eat, grab a, a quick drink, whatever the case may be, socialize, and then they get onto the fields. So we may not have to look at it in terms of a full 45 minutes if we shifted things off. We could actually probably squeeze that time in. We also have the component where if a student's making up an exam or they stay longer, they can get a pass from the teacher to go to the coach. Now we know that there's some inherent pressure on kids, especially at the varsity level. They don't want to miss practices. There's a game tomorrow, you know, so there's, there's theory and then there's reality, right? So we would also have to work through that. In terms of, um, you had talked about some of the morning pieces. So I think making a shift, you know, we'd have to probably work with teachers around a compromise to say perhaps you know, one of those sessions could be a.m. Or, or one session a month could be a.m. and the other ones would have to be p.m. Because there are some times when those morning sessions are actually advantageous for some of our kids, especially if they have an after-school commitment in a way contest, something that's out of their control. Or there's a, an activity where our kids are traveling to the Tufts Inquiry Project or whatever it might be, Model UN. So. We have done a lot of look at that, and, and that's frankly where I think the science is very clear. What I'm still struggling with, and my concern is that after school evening component. Because what I don't see happening is our kids aren't going to do fewer things. I think the reality is they're just not, right? We have highly competitive, highly engaged kids who want to be involved in these activities. They have their passion about whatever their activity is, whether it's drama, music, sports, extracurriculars, outside activities, volunteering. So my concern is when we shift or if we flip, we're gonna to have to look at how can we condense that time. We probably would have to look at our practice times and adjusting those and maybe setting uh, a policy or a protocol or a practice of saying an hour and 45 cups instead of two hours or 215 or whatever. So, you know, that's what we're looking at. One advantage we might have with either a flip or a shift, faculty, we could actually conduct some of the morning meetings. So I could conduct my monthly faculty meeting in the AM, and that would actually open up more afternoon opportunities for students to get extra help. So shifting does have some advantages that way. We did, as you recall, we did a flip uh, early release. Remember, we started later. And, um, you know, there were some pros and cons to it, but one of the pros was certainly the teacher PD was very effective because the teachers were fresh. It was the start of the day as opposed to, you know, the end of a day where, you know, you've already had the students, you've had all your activities, now you have to go to professional development. And some teachers have said that's a challenge. So, and so, so just to one, one thing to add to everything you said is, is we have seen in various places precedent for each of these ideas where it's in practice and, and working, right? And in some form or another, yeah. So the, the, yes. the occasional early help, the shortened practice time, the flexibility with perhaps competitions, uh, uh, working with other with other schools right. um, but all the these various the, the PD in the morning or the the faculty meetings in the morning uh, there's precedent somewhere in Massachusetts or sure. in, in, in more than we one would place. likely have to um, 
dismiss students occasionally early for some contests. There is already precedent for that. You know, we do it now for some of our tournament play that the state determines contests. Um, you know, as many of you know who have had high school athletes, golf is one of the things you have to work around mm -hmm. because that, that's a challenging one for schools. Mm -hmm. um, the other part are with daylight savings, depending on what the legislature is going to do with it right. and have an impact later in the fall on our uh, sporting programs. You know, and I know some schools have moved to some Saturday contests. I'm conflicted with that because I also feel like we perhaps are defeating part of our purpose around challenge success with family time and now saying we're going to hold, you know, junior varsity and freshman contests on Saturdays when, in fact, we really try to keep our younger students off our playing fields and home so that they can be with family or getting extra sleep. So that's the, mm -hmm. the balance there. So can, one, can I add one of the uh, one thing to that? So one of one thing that we figured out is that some of these details we we believe we're going to have to iron out in that space between the time that the decision is made and the time that it goes into effect because we we just can't weigh in all those variables at this juncture um so for example you know if if um if we were going to allow some extra help before school well we don't want to say hey you can have extra help any day uh, before school because what's the point uh, it completely defeats the purpose but would we allow some form of it as john mentioned and um perhaps uh things like uh the 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 work at the pine street inn i mean i don't think people are going to want that activity to stop and they go early in the morning because that's when they do the serving of breakfast so you know, we're not saying that um, if something like this were to happen, everything goes out the window. We're saying we would have to look at some of these things. But we have been gathering data. Um, probably the the most important person um, that I've spoken to on in terms of athletics or heard from in terms of athletics is the AD from Weston because they've been in a model where they're starting their day at 845. So theirs is even um, uh, shorter. So. Uh, later so and they had some pretty good feedback about what worked and what didn't but they they uh, pr pretty much the people I've spoken with have said it is definitely doable that is one thing I've heard then no who's taking questions can someone talk about the um, implications for the Boston students mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. absolutely so um, yeah Answering questions? Are we taking? Well, I, well, if they have the answer, I think we should just get it now. Um, I, we'll keep an eye on time, but I think if we can get some of it, I, I, I would be okay with that. Um, if there's something we need clarification on, that we yeah. can get back for. Thank yeah. you, Diane. Um, yeah, there are some things that I might not be able to answer tonight, so the plan was to just basically take mm -hmm. those questions and come back on the 30th. In the case of the uh, Boston students. We do know for sure that our Boston students are getting up very early now. And uh, a portion of our Boston students are not only getting up early, but they're getting up to come out here and wait for their Dover and Sherburn peers to show up. So that's a challenge that we've really uncovered through this process. It's kind of an uh, unexpected challenge in terms of the in terms of the buses moving to these potential different times, the consideration is primarily, and we had Deb, uh, Monique um, Marshall Veal come in, and Monique said the challenge from her perspective is about the traffic patterns at these various times. Um, but uh, she does believe, and and I and I asked her point blank. She does believe that she can that they can make these scenarios work, and if they make these scenarios work, those kids too would be benefiting the same amount of extra time. Well, unless, actually, if unless, I can, be, the the one of the things I'm not sure everybody around the table is is aware of that the the Boston students are on one one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the they're all on one bus that's coming in. And so the currently the elementary school kids need to get up really early 
uh, in order to be on that same bus as the secondary school kids, which would be, and, and then at the end of the day, the elementary school kids are in after school care until they get picked up with the second, actually, I guess they get on the bus first, yeah. and then it comes around here to pick up the secondary school kids. So it's, it's a it's a problem that is is at least in in my view something that as as joint school committee we ought to be looking at regardless of what's going on with with start times because it really it's it's unhealthy it's inequitable and something ought to be done with respect to figuring out how can we get two separate bus runs somehow or another whether it's combining with another uh, participating district uh, or or somehow coming up with the funds to run a, a second bus okay. Go ahead. Um, so I guess in terms of comments and questions and giving you feedback and direction um, first of all thank you so much to all of the members of the task force this is a huge was a huge research project and discussion project and um, I really appreciate the degree to which you took your um, work seriously, and particularly um, the degree to which you brought in research and did the PR and outreach to the different stakeholders um, in terms of everything from um, Dr. Seisler to making the video. Um, it, it really is quite impressive. Um, I very much appreciate the survey data. I actually thought that the students being split half and half is hugely positive because I understand from other school districts that this has been oftentimes implemented with students being really, really against it. And so the fact that we're at half and half is a huge positive, I think, and it's a credit to your all of your collective work in educating kids about what's best for them. Um, I really believe that we ought to make this decision based on what's best for students and not necessarily, you know, my kids don't like to take amoxicillin either, but when they are sick, well, maybe now we don't give kids antibiotics. But anyway, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I, I think that um, I also think that we need to take into account and do what we can to help the staff to be able to manage this change. But one thing I think is really important is that you're not thinking about doing this in September. You're thinking about doing it a year from September. So if this really doesn't work for a couple of people, then they have a long road to either make changes in their personal schedule or, you know, to make different decisions about, about where they want to work. I, I think we have to keep in mind that first comment from the um, – from the employee that made the first comment I thought was really, really important. Um, I appreciate very much the flexibility and looking at all different options for the adults to meet around the time. And I guess lastly, um, in terms of an observation about kids having less time after school to do things like sports and also clubs, while I totally recognize the idea that having more time with family is great, my experience observing kids is that many of us have children who are not only going to school, but school is like the part-time thing they do in between their high school sport and their club sport and their dance class. And while I know that it is not possible for us to tell people to tamp that down a little bit, maybe having actually less hours in which you could have all these other part-time jobs might make it so that that hand is forced a little bit. Because I think that if a student is doing their whole full-time job, which is school and some homework, and doing an uh, interscholastic sport and doing a club sport for 20 hours a week like that, that we we can't make time so I, I really applaud all the work you do i support whatever you feel comfortable doing at 10 a.m is probably too much but <laughs> thanks Maggie. Yeah. um let's wait for the community members first if that's okay yeah so, sorry uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Neil Kessler, sorry. I was just going to comment when you're done with the... Campaign. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Any other um, comments? I have some. Yes. Um, so I, the way I'm viewing this is that it's totally doable, and my questions are really more designed to help us figure out what's the best way to do it. Um, so I would love, we keep talking about, oh, there are lots of other schools that have done this. I'd like some specifics. Tell me, school X shifted by... You know, 20 minutes, and this is how they are arranging their schedule. This is how they dealt with the lunch, because now we, you know, if it's, or if it's a flip and it's, your day starts 45 minutes later, how do you deal with lunch? And we know that our um, space is already at capacity with that, and is that possible? We ha Do we have kids eating at 
you know, eating lunch at 2.30 um, because of space constraints. How are other schools dealing with that? How are they dealing, is there a school that's like us that has after school help, that has so many clubs for such a small community, um, that also has so that percentage of kids participating in sports? And if you add drama, also, you know, it's 90% participate in something like that. Mm -hmm. um, how are those schools, do I want specifics of how are they helping fit those things in? Because if you cut clubs by like 20 to 20 minutes, there's certain clubs that's fine. But there's some clubs, like if you're doing debate, you'd have to meet three times a week to make it work. You know, So that doesn't work for some organizations. Um, so I would love to hear the specifics. Um, from these other schools and ways that they are doing. Are, do they have clubs now? With, you can do go to a club and eat lunch at the same time. Maybe that's, I don't know. But it's more specifics from specific schools that have done this, that are like us. Um, also, we talked with Connolly about whether drivers can do a shift or flip. I know we talked about, you talked a little bit about, you've been talking to them about finding time, but if the drivers, percentage of the drivers have jobs that they go to, does having it later impact? Um, I guess that would be the shift, because the flip would be the same. Yeah, the flip right? would be the same, basically. So with the shift? With the shift. Okay. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't gone, we've been talking to them about bigger issues, but not drilling down yet, because it's still unknown. But they are, they have dealt with other school districts, and um, so they're, they're used to this, and I don't think they see any problem with the drivers, because most of their drivers are more on the retiree side. So they're there, this is sort of just their job. So it's just, they're not count, they're not balancing this with another job. Yeah, because I would, I would hate to have us say, oh, we're gonna do this, and then as we're trying to implement- I, I've it, seen like, that happen. That could not? be a problem. <laughs> yeah. And we, we do the contract with the buses one? Next year. So it's the timing is absolutely perfect. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but yeah. that was, my understanding was it wasn't just a cost issue for the bus. It was physically having enough drivers. They said that they were well, concerned they to do a to do a one ride. To do one to, ride. Yeah. to double to double our to double our um, force of drivers. Yeah, that would could be a real. They did say that that would be a huge challenge. So is that like off the table? Then I guess that's. I was going to say, is it a huge challenge or, <laughs> or not? It, it's well, I mean, if you couple. The difficulty with finding a, a whole nother set of buses, another set of drivers, and the, drivers. And, and the additional cost, we included it because we knew people were going to ask about it, but I'm not sure that it's feasible. I, I think a million dollar ask. Um, Annually. Uh, yeah, per year. Yeah. <laughs> not one time. <laughs> could be a deal breaker. Yeah. Okay. Any more? Mm -hmm. Any other yeah. questions oh, or clarifications? Yeah. So I have a question just about <coughs> scenarios. So um, if we're thinking about staying in alignment with the APA guidelines um, and thinking about an 8.30 or later start, which most districts are sort of look, that have changed recently are working toward and some even later. Um, one concern I've heard from elementary parents is they don't want their little people getting up so early in the morning and waiting for the bus in the dark. So is it possible to do a scenario like Weston where the little kids go, it's sort of a flip and a shift. So Weston, the little ones start at eight and the big guys start at 8.45, which does push the afternoon later mm -hmm. um, for the older students, but helps eliminate that super, super early start for the little ones. Um. So that one I want to look into a little further. Mm -hmm. um, that came out of the survey. Yes. I, I noticed that mm -hmm. uh, in some of the comments. Uh, it, I think that the, the big challenge with that and with all of this, really, with all of this, is that we're trying to figure out where that balance is, where's that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And um, what, for example, you'll, you'll note that when in with the shift where we moved from 740 to 810 with the secondary kids we did not move the same amount with the elementary mm -hmm. and that's because we believe we can squeeze 10 minutes of transportation time there um so we we didn't feel like we could move that um much more within without in fact and then we would have to move them both and therefore that with every five minutes that we move the elementary later in their start, 
we move the obviously the high school later with their dismissal so that um, 7.50 to 8 o'clock for elementaries moves our, seven, our 8.35 to 8.45. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So um, doesn't mean it's not possible mm-hmm. at all. Um, but it's something that, we, that I'd, I'd like to hear more from people about. Okay. And I guess I would just add to that piece that you would also be, if it were doing a flip and a shift it would be creating that much more opportunity for the kids who might be on the nine to ten hours Mm -hmm. to get the sleep they need each night so each five minutes really does include more kids in that in that pool yeah um this might be a this might be one of those details that you can't answer even by the 30th that rolls out as you get into more implementation details but the only data point in the survey that surprised me was the number of, of faculty members who said that they could no longer participate in supervisory roles and after school activities on a flip or a shift. And so I'd be, inter- I don't know if you can drill down on that, but if there's a difference in their answers between shift and flip, um, or maybe it, it's just one of those, hey, if, 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 Faculty member A can't do that club. Maybe faculty member B can do that club. So I don't, I don't think it would be an impediment to making a decision. But I thought that was the only thing that surprised me in the data that was up there. Right, because I counted that. I think it's like sixty percent. It was a big number that was either impossible add, yeah. or unlikely. Or right. when you add the three yes, together, right. uh-huh. it was a surprisingly yeah. high percentage. It, it was. It was surprising to me too. And and actually, it was one of the questions that I put forward to. Um, ADs. So this is not uh, relation to other activities, but I did put that forward to the athletic directors. That was a specific question I asked them. Did you find that it impacted your ability to retain or hire um, people? And they said no, not one. In in one in one case, not one. The other one didn't answer that question directly, and I don't think the other one did either. So I can dig into it a little more. Yeah, the other thing was sometimes plays into a that. short one question yeah. survey yeah. like to teachers to find out a little bit more. One thing that plays into that, just coming from a teacher perspective, yeah. is yeah. that you have this whole pool of people that teach at your elementary school who might be interested in coaching or running a club and they never can Mm, because they don't finish school until an hour after everybody so while i would never want to lose any of the current wonderful people that we have running all those clubs i think that you you also sometimes have people who work in other districts that would love to come over here but they can't get here in time Mm -hmm. so i think you know as far as having a pool of people that's probably unlikely we wouldn't be able to find people but i i agree i'd like to know what is it that but the, I think for coaches, especially for coaches from other places, that you actually, by going later, I agree with you, you actually increase the likelihood. Because I know coaches, people who can't coach because they can't, they don't end early enough. But that also could potentially cost more because we have <coughs> teachers who do clubs, mm-hmm. especially for no pay. And mm-hmm. if you need to bring somebody in, right. then that costs. But we should be giving people stipends anyway yeah. if they're doing clubs. Just <laughs> Yes. Another discussion. Yes. Um, all right. Any other, just to keep things moving, um, Adrian, I know you have something, but anyone else that hasn't had a chance to speak that has anything that they want to say? I just wanted to say something quickly um, to consider preserving that break time that the middle school has mm-hmm. now. Um, and mm-hmm. also that the homework load discussion definitely has to be part of a continuing conversation. Just. I just wanted to say two things just quickly. One is just to underline what some people have said about looking very forensically at um, the bus buses and when they arrive and when they um, and, and when they drop students off. Certainly at the region, you know, um, we have a 7:40 start time and buses are loaded at 7:15. Um, and the chickering, you know, for 8.35, I, I always used to see buses waiting there at 8.10. Yep. Um, so there is such a large degree of, of, of ease and easy win that can be done there. Um, and then, and I've spoken to Andrew and Beth about this months ago, um, but, but it's, it, it's, a, it, it's a long um, 
a long subject and a long term subject. I, I would just encourage uh, whenever there's time to 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 look very to try and look creatively about um, some of the new thinking about best practice scheduling and how creative scheduling of classes within a day can be uh, completely rejigged and, 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 and pulled back from a blank canvas and started again uh, in a way that can buy more time on learning in the same time at school. Um, and obviously pop-up schools or greenfield schools are very easy to do that because you start from a blank canvas, you think what's the most um, logical thing to do in terms of reducing the time that students spend transitioning and the time that students spend settling down and, and, and just to to maximize the time that kids spend in learn actually learning within a day and I, I there are professional scheduling consultants who, who come in and talk about that i would just encourage whenever dust settles in any way and there is a bit of time so to try and look very creatively at, at, at that because I think that also could be a sense of, of, of a source of time that we don't realize. Um, Anybody want yep. other questions? Question? When you mentioned the homework and I thought of it when um, the statistics were put up earlier, I know, you know, you know somewhere many times in the last four years we've had surveys done where we've asked students how much time do you think you're spending on homework, whether that was challenge success or through the district. And it would be interesting to see, has there been any change in that time period? Because we have done some other things that we thought were silver bullets to make a difference. Um, you know, and it just may be um, the way kids work <laughs> means for some students it will take four hours whether they have one hour of homework or six hours of homework um, and you know what they put on the survey but I, I would be curious to see what all the things we've done over the last few years if they've made an impact on the kids so John I'm, um, is that a uh a youth risk survey question. Challenge success. Yes. Challenge success. Yes. Yeah. No, I know it's on challenge success, but not on the youth risk survey. We've done two versions of the challenge success, and we've seen some decreases, but then other areas things have either stayed the same. And and I'm not sure that we have. Unfortunately, I don't know that we, didn't we have ask our the same categories that will line up. We didn't up. ask yeah. the same question, I don't think. They're a little different. Like, did, they're I different. Think, no, they're, I think they're a little different. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Maybe going forward, if we yeah. can sure. ask yeah. the same question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. So I, I have a, just a couple of quick things I want to ask. Um, just in the spirit of being thorough, I don't know if this has occurred or not, but um, has there been any discussion? If there hasn't, maybe you should at least lob a couple phone calls to um, our highway departments, safety, um, you know, changing of traffic times, getting schools ready when there's any sort of weather, because it might change depending on whether it's a flip or a switch. And again, it might not be a big issue, but if we're gonna do this right, I think it's worth asking um, everyone that may or may not be affected. Um, there's a lot of data on secondary kids. I haven't seen any data, and some of us have a focus on the, the elementary schools um, in this room. Um, on any of the younger kids and what it might do for them for sleep. So if there is data um, and you want to take two minutes, I'd be yeah. interested in hearing something. And if there isn't and we can find some, I think, um, at least I know a lot, of, a lot of the folks that we're responsible for would be like to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. it, can it, I take a couple of minutes with that? Yeah, sure. And there so, is data on the website too. Yeah, there is. The, the, there, it's true that there's not a lot of data. Mm -hmm. um, there, there haven't been a lot of studies. So some of what we have is anecdotal, um, although it's anecdotal from sleep scientists. Uh, the the I, last week I attended a presentation uh, by Judy, Dr. Judy Owens, who's one of the co-authors of the AEP policy statement. Um, so one of the things that 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 is a factually unknown is that this shift, the circadian shift in adolescence only happens in adolescence. Um, so the elementary school kids um, at the very least are not going to have that, uh, the drive for sleep that's two hours later in the day, which well, you just count forward, they do need more sleep than adolescents, um, but they get to sleep 
earlier than than and and this is where it gets into more of the scientific anecdotal but earlier than even the two hours earlier if that makes sense if so I they're important sleep earlier in there they the they absolutely get to sleep earlier and they wake up earlier on on average um, they also you can manipulate their uh, their circadian clock just like we can manipulate our circadian clocks which is different from adolescence you can't that drive that 11 o'clock drive is fixed and the manipulation is things around around light around food when your last intake of food is um, around activity certainly blue light and some of the other just good sleep hygiene things that's you know that's good for all of us to uh, to take in um, there there are some uh, districts around the state, uh, one of them being Sudbury, where there's some teachers, elementary school teachers, uh, who had the opportunity to teach elementary school kids with earlier start times and later start times. Uh, and so the commentary there is that the kids get, um, they get gassed in the later afternoon. Yeah. They're just, they're sleepier, the days are running too late, and when they start early, um, those days work a lot better for them. Uh, one final item that actually came out of the, the surveys is that the even though we have a 55 minute uh, difference in uh, start times for elementary schools and secondary schools, the average wake time of elementary school and, and secondary students is only 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that kind of supports that you know, the earlier natural wait time for elementary school students. Thank you. Um, and then one more item then, Mr. Kessler, I haven't forgotten you. Um, and this is a kind of a comment, but it's echoed what we've heard in the slide and then a few of us have talked about. I think, and actually Michael and I have talked about this, communication, which we've done a great job. And my, I spoke to someone, I think she was in either Sudbury or, Sudbury, um, or Wayland or something, and she said, if you think you've communicated enough, you haven't. So the more we communicate um, between now and the 30th or um, with all the other groups, the better we can be because this homework thing, um, the social media thing, the over scheduling, which um, a lot of the adults are as equally or more responsible than the parent than the children are, is a teachable moment for us to continue to talk about challenge success and everything else. Um, so I think highlighting that and if when something happens and whatever it may be, it's not necessarily about moving time, it's about changing behavior for everybody the best we can you know <laughs> we can't control everything but um i think you can just continue to keep reinforcing this whole idea which i think most of us are bored on so that's it for my soapbox on that one mm -hmm. mr kessler Thank please you. um so one thing my wife insists that i do is point out that i'm running for select board this spring yeah, sure. <laughs> so congratulations <laughs> so, i just but i did have a couple questions so one of the things i'm trying to do as a select board candidate amongst and also a parent of two uh, young kids in pine hill is just sort of get exposed to different sort of areas i'm in the conservation and affordable housing role but the school committee role is something that i'm sort of new to so i just wanted to say that sort of coming into this fresh, it's just seeing the presentation and hearing you discuss it, it's a tremendous amount of work you've done. And I really just want to thank you for it because it's, it is not uh, whimsical. <laughs> this is a project that obviously you poured a tremendous amount of research into and data into. Like one of my questions was about elementary school data. And it sounds like a lot of what you found is that for the kids themselves, it's, uh, it, it could actually be beneficial, which is good news to hear. Um, one question I had for you is in terms of the surveys, did you end up, because some of, some of the concern that I have or think other people might have would be around impacts to, to parents and, after, and all that sort of stuff, did you do any differentiation between sort of the elementary versus secondary in terms of what those impacts are? Because obviously going earlier for one group and going later for another when you do a flip means that it's going to have different impacts on the different sort of parent populations and I'm wondering if you if anybody looked at that or asked about that. That was that was on the survey so we do have that data uh, if I'm hearing you correctly in terms of impact on commutes and things like that. I'm more to like the kids getting home before you know, come kids. home late and they're not their kid. Early, Child you know. care type. And, and yeah. also even just sort of quality of, of interaction. My wife works late so the kids are going to be in bed some days when she gets home. And so there's sort of just the impact on seeing your kids every day and, and that kind of stuff. So I think some of it is 
child care and some of it is just quality of sort of family life. Mm -hmm. so. um, I, I mean, I, I don't know that we got, we definitely did not get to that particular question. That is, um, but that came up in the comments. Yeah. But we have been your could, comment. Yeah, <laughs> but we could parse out we could parse out the um, uh, the do a sort of the secondary versus elementary yes, child care. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We can sort. The the survey monkey is a great tool. It's amazing. So you can analyze all that data based on what level kids the person has. One of the things that was challenging for us when we were making these is we were asking questions like, Well, what time does your child typically fall asleep? Well, that's a problem because we have people who have first graders and 12th graders. So then we had to, you know, break those questions out. And that's why the, the uh, community, the family survey was longer. But we didn't want many questions either. Mm -hmm. so we were trying we to want many sure. questions either. So it's not too much of a burden. Okay. Um, one other question I had just as thinking about this sort of one run idea, and I understand that yeah, a million dollars, I can understand that being a deal breaker just out of the gate, it seems not realistic. And I'm wondering if anybody just from a logistics perspective has ever thought of hybridizing it a little bit, like, you know, combining, I mean, I don't know if you could, but I just was sort of thinking as you were talking about it, combining like one and a half runs where you consolidate secondary and elementary on certain buses, you know, the bus that goes by my kids doesn't have that many students on it. So I don't know if any of the sort of alternative logistics to sort of bring some of that million dollar cost down have been looked at at all. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things just we, and really more generally kind of observed is that you have school here, here, and here. Yeah. And it's really difficult to, because it's, it's they're kind of as far away as they could be from each other with the three towns that it would be hard to. So we did kind of think about, is it possible? But there'd be kids sitting on the bus for a long time from one to the the last. Meet the buses with bathrooms. <laughs> yeah, teach them why they're on the bus. <laughs> I, I miss that. Oh, no, consider consolidating bus stops. You know, stops every, you know. The thing is, even if you got it fifty percent better, it's still five hundred thousand dollars. So it, it's not it's not it's not going to go from a million to zero. So even if you picked up twenty five percent efficiency, it's still a number that would blow our budget. But what we do what we do want to do, I mean, we are we are definitely looking at our bus patterns, looking at the routes. We it's it's not as Michael said, it's not easy. These um, communities are really uh, spread out. So if you live on the other side of Sherburne, it can take you a long time to get over to here. Um, and if kids were, um, so that said, we may be able to come up with an option that does cost some money. That's why I put it on there as a, a possible implication, as a possible challenge. We might be able to add a bus and have a, an impact that shortens the runs or something like that. But that's all still not worked out. The only other thing I would say is just a comment, which is I know that people are aware that this is being studied. And so I think, Henry, you said more publicity is better. So especially now where you're in this kind of stretch run, you're going to make a decision at the end of the month. The more sort of information you push out there, and you've been doing a great job of it, but the more that gets out there, the better, because this is going to be a time when even sort of in a, an ad hoc fashion, people might sort of reach out via email or some other fashion just to kind of give you more feedback or come up with some crazy idea in a video. But um, I just would say just more better. Is this getting put out? So, um, I, yes, I am going to post that. But I, I think um, in hearing uh, Mr. Kessler's comments and Henry's comments, I think it, it makes sense for me to um, write to the community and tell them this meeting happened. This is what was shared. I'll put the link in there so yeah. people can see it. And here's the email address. And here's the email address for questions, comments. Um, Yes, and I, I would not rule out the possibility of a, a parent coffee between now and, and then as well. So there, there is one that is is on the, the well, a coffee, um, which is a, a, a probably a combined parent staff where's available um, that's being scheduled for Chickering. I think Pine Hill, maybe that's something that might go. So yeah, perhaps if, if that's something that could also be done 
high school and, and, and middle school so people can drop in and yeah, our big issue is vacation. Yeah, I yeah. think this is yeah, chickering. It's being done right after. I believe it's the Tuesday after vacation. Can we combine it to make. Oh. It, can it just be yeah. a I mean, district-wide? I, I think coffee? we can. I mean, I I think we can come up with something. One or two. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh yes. I was. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. I'm yeah. just thinking maybe something to do in the evening though, because if it's working parents, this is going to be yeah. the increased. Mm -hmm. Anxiety around that they would want to come in the evening. So, like you did here at the beginning of the year, that and, was well attended. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's really those aren't hard to do. I mean, I, I I like it when I have other people from the task force with me, kind of giving their <laughs> different perspectives. <laughs> well, you saw it tonight. I mean, you you, you get okay. the different perspectives of the people who've been involved. So. But I think we could do something like that. And and it, to me, it makes sense that you'd have either one or two at the elementary level and one at the secondary level. Yeah. The, the question is, it's almost, it, you're really almost talking about a, a two-week window to do that. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're just going to have to look at the schedules, right? Because after vacation, there's, is there that two week. weeks until the 30th? Well, oh, probably the week or is it after one? Yeah. It's one. It's one week after vacation. <laughs> one week. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So it's a we have tough a couple window. of days to get that on the calendar and, and advertise and get it. Get out with your your blast. And and really from this date forward until after vacation it's pretty tough to advertise. But we could try. Amanda. Um, I was just going to say, I feel a lot of our discussions revolved around logistics, which I think is natural at this point in time, and I think a lot of the feedback we'll get is concerns and anxieties about changes and how is this exactly going to happen and this exactly going to happen. And I feel like, um, as someone on the committee who spent a lot of time in the research, it's so compelling that this is the right thing to do for our kids' mental and physical health that I, f I feel like we need to remember that um, we have a terrific administration and I have great confidence in their ability to address these details and make this happen. Um, so I don't. I think it's easy sometimes to get lost in the minutia of that. And I think we just need to keep our eyes on the kids and their health. Yeah, and I will, I will add to that that I think it was brilliant of you to, to yeah I know you're looking at me <laughs> seriously to, to yeah. decide to give us to to that the decision should be made now and then we have an entire year to put our collective heads together and come up with the best possible way to implement it for us and I think that that's really crucial because it gives people a long time to raise their hand and say, hey, did you think about this? Did you think about that? And for us to, to really do it in a, in a reasoned way. And I think that's huge and fabulous. Thanks, Judy. And I, I would say, for example, like after school care, before school care, yeah. those are things that will need to be worked out. Mm -hmm. But you can survey people along that time, timeline, see who has interest, see if there's a need. For example, we learned from one community that they thought there was going to be a huge need for before school care. So they set it up and two families signed up for it. So but they're happy they did it. But they, well, they were happy. Who the families or the no, <laughs> just uh, the the committee, the school right. committee. Yeah, yeah. So, and just one one other point too, just to to follow on on your comment, Amanda. Um, there, there, uh, Ashland had I I hmm. spoke with uh, the the um, school committee chair there. They had actually um, the school committee voted on a range, said this is the range we 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 want things to shake out. You guys figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, and you can be with that range, but you figure out the details and really just they, they empowered the administration to move it a bit to the left or to the right um, as necessary and to come up with the details. And then others, it's, it was very, very prescribed. You know, this is exactly how it's going to be with all the details. So certainly a little bit more to think about. Plenty. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank, you. You Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, our next item we have uh, um, in our packet, I think it was called the short packet, um, <laughs> uh, a memo from Dr. Keo regarding the last day of school. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as uh, we all know, we had um, one snow day this year. Um, which was not ideal because that one snow day um, pushes our school year uh, from the 14th to the 17th. And um, 
So I, I am recommending, uh, after much thought and a, a great deal of input from the administrators and um, people who have written to me, uh, unsolicited uh, requests and comments, um, that our um, our hundred eighty first day being on the Monday the seventeenth. It is a half day for students. It's uh, getting into later June. Uh, there are a lot of people who have uh, a lot of our students have activities plans. Our high school students are essentially done at that point, anyhow, uh, because of their exam schedules. I am uh, making the recommendation to all of you that we make our last day, the 180th day, which would be June 14th. Um, and you stated it's for the students. For the, the students. Um, it, would it be a full day of school? No. And what would be the last day for the faculty? Well, the last day um, contractually, because they had a snow day, the last day for faculty would be that Monday. And what would they do that day? Is that the 184 days? That's the 184th. No, they usually work the day after. So they would work till Tuesday? No, that, no, they work the last, typically they work. The students aren't there last Right, so they work, usually there. work one more day after the students get out. No. But it's yes, the last yes. day. But it's the last day of um, school for everybody else. Like the students are here on the middle school. There's just no students at the high school. Right. So they're the last day for the students is usually a half day for students and a full day for teachers. So in essence, because that's the makeup exam day would be the Friday, and that would be the last day. Is that how it works? Is that a makeup day, John? Typically, we have that last day as makeup. Right. 17th. Yeah. And do the high school teachers work all day or not? Nope. Day? They catch that day. Right. And um, are there makeup days um, earlier than that last day? In terms of. Are there other opportunities for kids to make up exams if they've missed any other exams in the exam week period? Are with, yeah, with uh, teacher um, collaboration, yes, because of the way that the exams are set up now, students may not have uh, two exams in a day. Exactly. So, yes, there is not. So, so in my experience as a principal, and I'm sure this is the same for you, John, by the time you have that last day, you have to have it. You need to have it. You need to allow for it. But the kids are pretty crafty in getting them all done before that last day. <laughs> Unless they're yeah. sick. And every year we have a small group that right. still will take them for yeah. different reasons. Yeah. So in this scenario that we're discussing now, that last day makeup opportunity would be still on that Friday the 14th? We'll be squeezed in to those days, um, yes. So teachers will be working 183 days and not 184 days. Well, I, we're not talking about the teachers, though. We're talking about the students right now. Everybody will finish on Friday, June 14th. Isn't that what you said? No. I said the students would finish on Friday. And teachers, teachers will on finish on Monday, the yes. 17th. So that provides them an extra professional day then? Yes. Or professional time. And that's the 184th day, that Monday? Mm-hmm. Andrew, can I just ask what the, the logic of make, given the dynamics, making the Friday a half day instead of a Friday a full day. Um, my thinking was that the last day of school is always a half day, and because you know, as somebody who's worked in schools, uh, that last day is is not easy, <laughs> and just extending it because we want to say that we've extended it, which I've had that conversation with people before, doesn't always pay off. It's not the most productive day of the 180 or 181 ends up being uh, challenging. The kids are excited. They know that summer's here officially. And it's tough, I think, if we ask the teachers in the room, it's a tough day to teach. I mean, I guess my feedback is that while, I, you know, and I'm speaking as a school member and also as a teacher who's been doing this whole routine for 
25 years. Um, while I understand and have finished on many a Monday myself and nobody loves it, I feel like we made a commitment to this community that our children go to school. It used to be, I believe, 182 days maybe, I'm imagining. We cut one of those in part of our budget needing to, to and I feel like it's been our precedent that students go to school 181 days. I'm a person who, I, maybe you've got a lot of people who wanna go to Timbuktu, but I am a person who has always historically had to pay for daycare, and I count in September on 181 days. So if my kid was scheduled to go to school on Monday, and you take that away, that's, I mean, a lot of money I pay for my kid to now have to go to a daycare program. And I guess I feel like we set the calendar in September, and it's our precedent that students go to school based on an 181 days calendar. And I feel like we're really setting a slippery slope here. If you were here talking to me about the 29th of June, like I'm looking at June and we're, you're saying late in the summer, actually to get out on the 17th is pretty early in Massachusetts. If you were talking to me about it's the 29th of June, it's the same week as 4th of July, we've had 10 snow days, I, I would feel differently. But we've had one snow day. I feel like I made a commitment to my constituents and to the families that they would have those days of school. I feel really uncomfortable with this. Right. And I feel like by making the last day a half day on Friday, I understand kids are wacky on the last day, but they're gonna be wacky in the last day if the last day is the 17th or if the last day is the 14th. And if they're wacky starting the 14th, they're gonna to start to be wacky on the 10th because uh, I, they'll be like, last week of school. I don't know if there'd be a difference between wacky on a Friday or wacky on a Monday, or maybe wacky on both Friday and Monday. Well, for me, I can plan a whole week of school that last week is actual school, and then Monday can be the wacky day. Well, so I mean, the, the whole the whole point of this process, I've I've gone back and looked at the the policy. I mean, the school committee clearly clearly sets the calendar. So I'm only recommending it. It's can a I recommendation. Say that so I. I I think, based on discussions that my middle schooler has had already, they are not planning to come to school on Monday. But that's a think, family choice. I don't think that you're necessarily in the majority. I know, but that's a family choice for you because yeah. your child doesn't need care during the day. For families who have to otherwise pay for care for their kids during the day, it's a big deal to lose a whole day that I counted on. I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying the, the attrition okay. might not be as desired yeah. but just we based on it already conversations that are okay. well, because the school committee we faced this choice a few years ago and we left the calendar as it was and they went the Monday Monday Tuesday something like that I also um, know that a great deal of time effort energy discussion went into the contract we currently have that we follow um, and there's as Maggie said, we set the calendar, everyone knows that's what it is. Um, that's how we base our budgets, our expenses, et cetera. Um, I would have a difficult time changing that. I think there's nobody who's, I mean, there's no child who's going to lose out on an experience if they elect not to go to school on the last day of school. They lose out on a party, they will survive. But if we don't offer school, then I feel like we're, I don't know, I feel really uncomfortable about this decision. So one thing about the calendar, setting the calendar, that last week is a flexible end date. No, it depends on the snow days. days. If there are no if snow days, then no they could be Wednesday. Wednesday. Right, but so, you know. no, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying the moving of the day, whether it's a Monday or a Tuesday, um, changes in those last couple of days anyways. I'm not talking about the number. I'm talking about, you said Monday or Tuesday. It changes if there's snow days, no, right? No. Well, I'm saying, no, last time we did it, it may have been a Monday and a Tuesday. Well, right? that's a unique, that's so every situation sure is different, right? right? So um, it just so happens that the calendar happened to fall in this Friday, Monday thing with one snow day. Um, that might happen next year, it might not happen for 50 years. Uh, so you look at every scenario in unique situations as it's in at that particular time. I don't know about, I don't think we're setting a precedent. We're looking at a precedent maybe in this particular scenario, but if that doesn't happen again, then it doesn't come back up again. I, I think it's interesting to hear whatever I have yeah. to say. I'm just saying there's other sides right. as well. And I'm saying that from a contract standpoint and the negotiation that went into and the discussions that went into how many days we would have and whether it was 182, 181, teachers teaching 185, 184. I just, for, it's for, a difficult. To for me, it just feels a little odd voting for less time in school. Um, 
I think if, if the Friday was a full day, I would be able to reconcile things a little, a little easier. So in, in response to that, because I, I get I get that a lot, um, at least I'm hearing that, I think it's pretty clear that our kids work incredibly hard in this school system. Mm -hmm. They are telling that, us that over and over and over and over. We have a goal as a district to take care of the social emotional well-being of kids. We also have a goal about our teaching and the importance of our teaching and our learning. So they're up against each other on this particular one. When I was in the position to make a decision on this, that's where my heart landed. That's not to say that the other uh, that you know that perhaps a case could be made. My gosh, we're we're going to miss out on that you know that half day of of learning. But then again, there may be some really valuable learning experiences that kick in in the summer because I don't believe that this is the only place that good learning happens. So it's a tough decision. I understand that, but um, and again, it's it's a recommendation, and I understand that it might not, um, you know, go through. And when, I mean, we can do a straw poll, but is there anyone else we haven't heard from that has an opinion? Can I just, I, and maybe I'm being slow to pick up on this. So if Friday would be a half day? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we make Friday a full day? Does that meet in the middle? You could. We could do it. Do you want a straw poll, all three? Can, 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 I, can I ask After comment? Can I all three options. Uh, I, I, people have said their opinions, but... What what was the what was your basis for saying Friday as opposed to Monday? Um, did I miss that, or what was the rationale, or how did how did your thinking get to that? Um, my basis was that the uh, as we get into you did miss it as we get into June, uh -huh. it's a much di more difficult time to retain <clears throat> the kids uh -huh. in terms of their coming to school. It's more difficult time to keep their attention in the school. Okay. As the year lags on, mm -hmm. it's harder and harder for the teachers. If you ask the teachers, they'll tell you it gets more and more difficult as the year goes on. And my feeling is that bringing the kids back for a half day on Monday yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense because it also interferes with kids who are planning to do other important educational things and mm -hmm. not necessarily educational. Perhaps family, as as John mentioned, but other experiences that take place in the summer. So yeah, the scheduling thing is a little. I mean, you can't schedule for that Friday or that Monday too far in advance, anyways, because of the snow days. So well, that's, no, that's, but there, that's there, are, there are programs, Absolutely. especially as kids get older. There are nationwide programs yeah. that do start earlier because, in general, New England gets out later than mm -hmm. the South and but, other but, parts of the country and that's not a huge it, percentage it's something as a principal you're asked thing. every year i think that as a parent if you all those nationwide programs come with big price tags and so if we are saying we're ending school early so that people can go to things schools and the high school has always been extremely flexible with kids who needed to leave early and take exams early for important things that take them far away but for families for whom the summer is not a parade of enrichment activities for families for whom the summer can be long days spent in front of the tv or in daycare centers or in other things School is actually the enrichment place, and I feel like we're programming for our most well-to-do, but we care for all of our children, and we promised them 181 days, and I'm sad that we're not, I think that that's a commitment to, to the families. I, can I, yeah, respectfully maybe. Absolutely. Because I'm not, I, I worked the right. entire time my kids were in school, and I had childcare until they were, Till both of them were able to drive. Mm -hmm. I still had it when one of them could drive. <laughs> and I, I don't, I don't believe that having school on that Monday is going to appreciably assist fa working families, or that. Um, the assistance that it might give to those working families outweighs the I think it's a negative message to send about and I don't know how to articulate this correctly in a, in some sense the value the 
the the lack of value of family activity and downtime. And I think calling the kids back for three hours on a Monday just intuitively makes me think that we're being strict with no educational purpose. It's okay. We can totally I, agree to disagree about that. And like I, I'm saying, and I, it would be it's okay. We can totally okay. disagree. And like I said, if this if we were talking about Fourth of July week where families yeah, have to I, walk, I, yeah. I'd feel differently. If we were like one of those districts that had so many snow days, we were talking about bringing kids yeah. back on a Saturday. I'd feel I totally feel the same. We're talking about June seventeenth. I feel like that's totally in the realm of when kids around here are still in school. But that's okay. Just one point yeah. on that because of if it ends on a Friday and for the families that are looking yeah. to care for the kids. They can't start Monday to Friday. Yeah, for so sure. what they're going to lose on pain for Monday. Not or kids could choose to not go to school that last day. Right. That, so no, we can keep the then, let's yeah, keep the discussion within the school committee, yeah. please. You know, if it's neither in the camp in the if, if you have to if that's your care child care decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so what do you what's do you want a motion? Do you want a straw poll? Um, I think it might be interesting to take a straw poll to mm -hmm. see where each committee stands. On the recommendation, um, or do you, want, do you want two or three? Let's, let's see what would you like, Michael. Yeah, Sorry, what would you like? Well, I think we should take the recommendation. Oh, no, I was wondering if you had two, if you had both of them, if you had two you wanted to present. Oh no, I was just wondering if it, because uh, because I heard full day maybe an alternative of of full day on Friday versus half day or. Alternative. Well, that's I, a legitimate yeah. question. If we just, if we can call it Kate Porter's, Porter's suggestion. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is it? Do you have a motion to, you want to put forth? I thought you wanted to strong. No, it's just too strong. Well, I mean, it, well, we, someone's going to offer something for us to make a decision on. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. On, on the recommendation that the superintendent put forth? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Do we do it by the whole group together or by individual school committee? We vote individual. by committees. Okay. Well, is this is straw poll or is this a straw poll? Can we just do everybody? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So let's see. What does everyone feel about the recommendation that Dr. Kia put forth? Is it in those of us that would be in favor to no longer have, to not have class on Monday, but have a half day on Friday? And you can vote for multiple things if you're yes. happy to vote okay, for okay, multiple okay, things. Okay. okay. How many is that? Cost is Dover. Oh, we're just going to stop. Ten. How many was that? Ten. Thank you. Ten. Thank you. Passes the region. Um, those that, so it's ten to six, right? How about if it was a full day on Friday? Ten to five. Ten to five, which is it? Sorry, ten to five. Thank you. What is that? Eleven. Okay. Eleven for full day. So eleven four. Okay, do we want to have any further discussion or do we have to hear, would like to hear a motion? Can we talk a little bit about why we historically do the extra beyond the 180? What was the thinking? Do we know what the thinking was behind? So it was 182 and then two contracts ago. Um, it was agreed by the... As part of the negotiations. As part of the negotiations. It was agreed that it would go to 181. Um, that there would be one less, one less day with teachers. So they went from 185 days to 184 days. How did we start like getting beyond the 180? We were I, we've been always just I believe it was actually when I was on the school committee in the late 90s <laughs> <laughs> that Perry Davis made it 183. Oh. And then it went back to the 182, which it stood at for a long time. And then I think it went. You're saying more recently. And it's time on learning because yeah. if you remember, all the elementaries yep. had every Wednesday half day. That, that's right. That was a big part of it. That's, that's right. Exactly. That's absolutely right. Yeah. But, but mm -hmm. having that and having the long length of day that we have in the school district is what allows us to, for example, have break, have that middle school recess. So in other school districts where they have 180 days and sort of a shorter school day, those are not options on the table because right. you can't the fit the amount of you. Time on learning doesn't count passing time or homeroom or lunch or breaks. That said, I did. Um, it's important to point out. I don't think I said this, did I? That no. um, that all four of the schools have checked in with them in terms of their meeting the 990 at the secondary mm -hmm. level and the 900 at the elementary level, and we are above that in all four instances under the proposed mm -hmm. model. So we would be more above it. 
And it does give you a flexibility back. I try to think during my tenure, we had six snow days. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, instead of extending the calendar, we let the calendar stay as is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that gives you flexibility when weird things happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that's also one of the benefits. Mm -hmm. So is the fear that if we do it this year at 180 instead of 181, that we'll somehow be making a precedent? No, it's not what the contract discussion was all about. So I can't elaborate publicly. But uh, I, uh, um, yeah. okay, sorry. I just yeah, yeah, yeah no, I hear you. Yeah. So we should, we should, we should get a motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do I hear a motion to accept? Um, do I hear a motion that we would end school on Friday? June 14th, after a full day of education. Oh, I'll make that motion. Uh, for Dover, that is. Uh, do I have a second? Second. OK. Regent, do you have a motion? Um, I'll move that. I'll second. Sherburn, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. OK, Dover, is there any discussion? Dover, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Right, reach in discussion? No. Right, all in favor? Mm -hmm. in discussion? I don't feel. All in favor? Yeah. Good. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, it, it didn't pass at the region. It didn't pass the yeah, it did. Oh, you voted yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't see Lori's hand. I thought it was just. Looked like two. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't see. Oh, yeah, no, it was four. Oh, it was four. Full day. Oh, I missed that completely. As long as as long as Amy got it. I was going to ask you what that. Yeah. So it was 4-0 at Dover, 4-1 at Region, and four two. I'm sorry, four two at Region. And 4 0 Sherwin. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I would communicate that clearly once yep. again. Yes. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Will do. Uh, so, the next item on our agenda is a consent agenda for approval of minutes from January 15th and March 20th. Is there any comment or uh, updates that were missed? Great. Um, we need to approve these by each committee again. Thank you, Prior. Uh, Dover, do I hear a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda as presented in our packet? So moved. Second? Second. Thank you. Regent? So moved. Second. Sherburn? So moved. Second. All right, Dover discussion? Mm -hmm. all, approve, all in favor? Aye. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not even asking if there's discussion. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just well, trying to follow the rules. And Sherman? Yes. Unanimous. Yeah. Sherman? Great. Um, I'm going to call for an adjournment. Uh, we're going into an executive session to, uh, with respect to collective bargaining and to not go back into open session afterwards. Do you have we to need, poll for that? We need to poll to go into executive session. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Do we have to vote? Do we have to poll individually? Yeah, we're supposed to be. Yeah. We did, right? Everyone raise their hand. Yes. 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 I, 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 yes. Thank you. I. Just Amy fixes it. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.